Welcome to this episode of Unraveling Adoption, an intentional space to delve into adoption's complexities together. I'm Beth Syverson. I'm an adoptive mom of a smart and adventurous 20-year-old son, Joe, who is launching as an adult. I'm walking beside him while working on my own personal growth and healing. I'm also a certified coach helping primarily adoptive parents. Joe and I are committed to helping anyone impacted by adoption, and we want to help the general public understand adoption's complexities better too. So here's the question for you all to think about during this episode. What does it mean to be in a family? And what does it take to create healthy family relationships, especially in reunion with birth families? Today's guest is David R. Ford, an adoptee who was reunited with his birth family 20 years ago and who is still trying to navigate the intricacies of family relationships. His memoir, which I recently completed reading and highly recommend, is called Blind in One Eye. So welcome to Unraveling Adoption, David. Thank you so much for sharing your story here. Beth, it's a pleasure to be with you. I really, really enjoyed your book. Thank you for reading it. Yes, absolutely. I have a whole stack, but I really enjoyed yours. It was interesting and unusual the way your family story turned out. So can't wait for our listeners to hear. So can you give us the basics? How old were you when you were adopted? What was your early childhood like? Happily. So I was adopted at birth. It was a uh, private adoption handled by a lawyer who managed both sides of the relationship. Mm. So my adoptive parents had some limited information about my birth parents, which they were more than happy to share with me as soon as I was old enough to understand. I think they were very open from the beginning. So whenever my little brain could understand the concept of being an adopted kid, they were quick to share it with me. Okay. Later on, as I asked more questions, one of the things my mother said was, well, anytime you want the name of that lawyer who handled the adoption, we'd be happy to give it to you. The one thing the lawyer did, he kept everything confidential, so neither sets of parents met each other. Okay. The one thing he did do was share tiny bits of information with my parents about my birth parents. Hmm. So the little information I had was first that my birth parents were married, which, of course, would have been a big deal back in the 50s when I was born, there being such a social stigma on married people having children. And the second more important bit of information was that I had a seven-year-older brother. The story was that he was a sickly child when I was about to be born. And they could not manage to have another kid in the household. Obviously, the underlying story being that there were just two children that they had had. Okay. So that's what I grew up with. Okay. And I will say that I was not one of those adopted kids who was concerned about finding his birth parents. But my brother, this seven-year-older brother, yeah. uh, loomed very large in my childhood. I bet. So every time I got abused by somebody or was unhappy about things. I wanted to think of this mythical brother as being there by my side. Yeah, where is that brother? So that's the core of what I knew for most of my life. Mm, I can imagine that fantasy of this brother swooping in and helping you out when you need it. And ah, dang it. I'm going to guess that's not how it turned out. (laughs) (laughs) Don't ruin the book. (laughs) (laughs) So when did you start seeking your birth family Did they try to find you or did you try to find them? Well, some of my birth family did try to find me, but I didn't know that. Ah. And I didn't really get serious about it until probably my late 30s. I just, as I said, I'd I'd never had a big need to find my Mm -hmm. birth parents. But this brother was sitting there out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And through an odd set of circumstances, I got really sort of compelled to find my brother because a friend of my wife's had seen somebody who looked just like me on the D.C. subway where we lived. And while I doubted that that was my brother, Mm -hmm. I started thinking about the fact that I was approaching 40 and Mm -hmm. my brother would be in his late 40s. And Mm -hmm. What if I went looking for him 20 years from then and discovered that uh, he was gone? So I started doing some of the things that you could do back then before the Internet. I contacted the state of Virginia, which was singularly unkind about the whole thing, Mm. provided me with very sketchy information in my birth file. The state of Virginia at that time and to this day, even though I know who my birth parents were, I know everything I need to know. To this day, the only birth certificate they're willing to give out is the fake birth certificate that says I was not born to the people I was born to. Unreal. So I spent a lot of time um, messing around with the kinds of things you did before 23andMe mm-hmm. and 
all the other things. Mm -hmm. And it was really unsuccessful. Mm. It just went nowhere okay. until I finally decided I needed to hire a private investigator. I'm a lawyer. I had access to private investigators. Uh -huh. And that started to tip the scales. Okay. Um, I started finding the things that I needed to know. Okay. And so who was the first person you found? Well, the first person that I found was, in fact, my birth mother. Okay. My private investigator made it clear that the only person on the earth who actually we could trust to know that I existed was the person who gave birth to me. Okay. And he started telling me all the tales of, well, you know, the lawyer said that your parents were married, but that may not be true. You may not be the child oh. of that man, oh, okay. you know, all of those kinds of so things. So need to go right to the birth mom. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So he had told me at the time that it was either going to be very easy to find my birth parents or very hard. Okay. Because I had by then gotten a little sketchy information. I'm sort of skipping over things, but I eventually made contact with the son of the lawyer who had represented my parents and the adoption. Mm -hmm. I got some more sketchy information, including my parents' name. And the investigator said, it's either going to take us no time at all, or it's going to take a long time. Okay. And he was right. It unfortunately took the latter. It took a long time. Oh. But eventually he was able to make contact with my birth mother, who vehemently denied that she was my birth mother Oh, and gave him more information that she had two other children, that she had not had me as a child. And to my surprise, he had at that time given my birth mother my contact information, Oh, which then meant that before I knew it, I was the subject of angry phone calls at my office and my home from a woman who was trying to make clear to me that she was not my mother and did not want me to have any further contact with her. I eventually did talk to her because she kept calling until I, wow. I, I could connect with her. She denied that I was her son and told me she would call the police and cause all kinds of trouble for me if I did anything more with it. Wow. You'd think if she really wasn't your birth mother, she would just drop it and never want to talk to you again. <laughs> like, what is that? Thou well, dost protest exactly. too much? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Exactly. Okay. Which was at my first indication that my birth mother was not among the most stable people on the planet. Not a healthy person. Shoot. So um, probably a few weeks after that, I got yet another phone call from her. I returned her phone call and she uh, pretty much acted like she didn't know who I was, seemed to not remember any of the phone calls that had happened, but did acknowledge me. And at that time told me that her older son, the, the person that I had been looking for, and her two younger daughters, who I didn't know about, didn't know who I was, didn't know about me, and that it would be a disaster oh. if I reappeared in her life. What did that do to you when she said that? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I had to add to the complexity that she had four children yeah. and gave one up. Mm. And I figured out that the next child that was born was barely 15 months younger than I was. So and they kept that one. Yeah. So what was that all about? Hmm. The good news for me was that on Mother's Day of the year that I found her, this was in 1995, I got a strange phone call from a woman in Ohio, left a voicemail message on our home phone saying, that she had a confidential matter to discuss with me regarding, and then she said my birth mother's name. And mm. except for my wife, Tibby, and me, nobody in my universe knew that name. Oh. So I'm sad to say that being a lawyer, my first instinct was that this woman who was trying to reach me was herself a lawyer oh. and was somebody hired by my birth mother to tell me to leave her alone. I felt like I was leaving her alone, so I was very confused. Oh. But I returned the phone call. And this woman, her name's Linda, asked me if I knew who, and she mentioned my birth mother's name was. I said, yes. And she said, do you know about her children? Do you know who I am? And I said, no. Mm. And she started telling me the story of my birth family, mm. which was that she and two other girls were also given up for adoption before me by my birth mother. Mm. The three of them had been looking for me for decades wow. and had only found me because my birth mother admitted to the woman who had called me, who had had a bit of a relationship with my birth mother, that I had reappeared. Okay. So on that phone call, I went from being the only child that I'd always been until age 40, suddenly becoming one of seven children. Seven. Four of us given up for adoption in a row by my birth parents in secret uh. and three raised by them. So she had the oldest son and then Four of you that she relinquished, and then two more that she kept. That's right. 
Okay. That's right. And you guys have an interesting name for the ones that she kept and the ones that she didn't keep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, the keepers and the throwaways. I'll let you guess which are which. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you can laugh uh, about it's that. It's all in fun. It's all in fun. <laughs> it's painful, but I, you sometimes just have to just go with what really is happening, right? Like, okay. Right. So did you ally yourself with these other quote unquote throwaways? Did you create relationships with them? Almost immediately. Almost immediately. These other ones that were also relinquished, you felt a camaraderie with, I'm sure. Well, remember, I'd never, as an adopted kid and until my 40th birthday, I'd never spoken to somebody that I was physically related to. I mean, the blood related. And these are full-blooded, full relations, yeah. not like half. All, all seven of us are uh, the children Same of these, this couple who, wow. during all of this, led a white picket fence, middle-class life. Mm. No one in their family knew that they'd given up these kids. My birth mother was pregnant yeah. for all of seven years with kids she wasn't going to keep. I think I read the neighbors didn't even know. It was like just right. nobody knew. She just, there was baggy clothes and just yep. she'd go away for a weekend or whatever to go give birth and then just come back. <laughs> well, actually, I saw a picture of my uh, next oldest sister who's, all of my siblings were all kind of tall. Okay. There was a picture of her when she was, I think, seven or eight months pregnant in a pair of jeans standing sideways. And you couldn't tell. I mean, okay. You couldn't tell. So genetics. So apparently it's it a gift. It's a okay. gift. Okay. <laughs> Boy, I, I, man, that doesn't happen very often. So that's fascinating. Okay. So you developed these relationships with these other, these were the sisters, right? It was you right. and the three sisters mm -hmm. right. that were relinquished. And what was that like for you to all of a sudden have siblings? Did you feel like you won the jackpot or? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And what happened immediately, of course, was I got on the phone with all three of the sisters and mm -hmm. had hours long conversations and yeah. You know, you start, maybe it's wishful thinking or whatever, but you start seeing common interests and mm -hmm. common ways of thinking about things. And, sure. you know, we started exploring those things, the things that we would know about each other after 40 years that we had no clue about. Yeah. And fairly promptly after that, uh, the, the three sisters came to my house. Wow. And we spent the weekend together and it was startling. I mean, obviously I was excited about it. So that excitement translated into just wonder. I mean, it was just quite amazing to be around these people that I didn't know, Yeah, but they were my siblings. One thing that I loved about your book was the teasing and the lighthearted way you related with your siblings. Mm. It seemed very youthful and like, oh, gosh, I've been waiting to do this for so long. I mean, you never even knew you had siblings, but you guys caught up, it seems like, with all the kind of the banter that siblings often have. Mm -hmm. Was that always positive or were there some times where it was like, oh, that stung? Did it ever get kind of awkward? Well, you know, uh, I, I don't know what it's like for other people who've lived a life with seven kids. I'm sure that there are sharp elbows. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of personalities. And so, sure, I've had tattoos of, of a little a minor yeah. sort with yeah. my siblings. I'm just what you would expect. I'm closer to some than others, just as I, I'm guessing other brothers and sisters are. The more challenging thing was almost within a month or two, I guess my birth mother finally admitted to the three other kids that we existed. Mm -hmm. Oh, and to our surprise, two of them very quickly made contact with us. Okay, and as a result of that, six of the seven of us got together in person again at my house within months of my discovering all of these things. Nice. So we got a chance to get sort of a window into my birth family's life. Nice, and that was interesting. The challenge was that my brother and I are probably the least alike of yeah. all of my siblings. So this and, fantasy uh, hero. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it remained a fantasy, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> yeah, you guys were like oil and water. It seemed like there was this a lot of differences, kind of a cultural difference, a class difference, kind of a mm. just a way different sensibilities, mm. even though you're completely related by blood. But I mean, help. That happens. Me and my brother don't have very much in common either. And we're yeah. raised together. So that can happen right. with siblings for sure. For sure. But I'm sure that was disappointing. I bet there was some grief around that. Like, oh, I have a brother, but it didn't work out the way you had hoped. Mm. No, and it actually complicated things. Um, he was um, not particularly generous to my wife. Mm. And mm. he sort of, in many ways, pushed her aside in, mm. in our attempted relationship. And 
my wife and I have a very close relationship. So that was quite a, yeah. a, a road. And I, I have to say that I'm not proud of how I handled it. I think mm -hmm. I tried too hard to be his friend. Yeah. And to some extent to the disadvantage of my wife. Mm. And um, we got over that. And yeah. uh, I stopped doing that. I ended up having to set some boundaries and work through things. But uh, is that the way it is with every uh, every family, I guess? Yeah, I suppose that happens, I'm sure. And I am very happy to say that your wife-to-be is here with us today. And I'd love to hear her input about this. I asked David if it would be okay if Tibi came on, because I think it's fascinating to think about the spouses. Because we, I don't know, we always are talking about the adoptees and adoptee voices, and which is super important. But the spouses are along for this ride, whether you want to be or not. And hi, Tibi. Welcome to Unraveling Adoption, first of Thank all. Thank you. And I just want to know, can you give us a glimpse of what it was like to be kind of on the sidelines, but also in the action of what all is going on with this family? Be kind. Well, <laughs> no, but it's it's interesting because obviously I was there for virtually everything, ah, Yeah. but I was very much on the sidelines. Okay. And particularly in, you know, the situation of David's oldest brother, because he was, I don't know quite what the age difference was, but he, I think, had been in Vietnam. Oh. And I think he was a very manly kind of guy and wanted to prove himself mm -hmm. a manly kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So I think that he and I just, I was never impressed with him. But I think, too, that it was such a barrage of mm -hmm people and information and it's it wasn't just everybody's coming over to our house for one night or whatever it just everybody not everybody could get enough of the other ones yeah i bet and so i i think that i was enthused about them as well but the fact is when something like this is as you know amazing as this happens it's hard for people to say okay well but you know now we've gotten together this many times and maybe we don't need to do it next weekend or whatever. And, and I'm not, I don't have notes on this or anything else. I'm just sort of giving the impression that, that I had. She spent way too much time in the kitchen. Okay. So you were like the maid. She was doing a lot of, right. She was, yeah. 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 <laughs> Entertaining is no small task, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I like to cook, but I, I yeah. kind of like to talk to people too. But it seems like socioeconomically, you guys were on the higher end compared to the siblings. Is that fair? That's true. That's yeah. true. Most of them, anyway. So I bet things ended up at your house a lot. <laughs> you know, they're spread all around the country. Oh. One lives in Florida, another in Utah, another in Ohio. Oh, wow. So all three of the keepers do still live relatively close to the original homestead, but okay. but we're all over the place. And okay. early on, we had some reunions and went mm -hmm. to Florida and did some things like that. But I guess as with everything else, it sort of settles in, right? And yeah. you know, it ends up being more phone calls and whatever. But the early phase that Tibby was talking about, intense for everyone. Yeah, and, intense. Mm -hmm. And I think you're really right to emphasize the people who are, I guess, technically on the periphery, but uh, yeah. very much in the middle of it, really. Yeah, plus you're having, you know, I'm sure you experience the event and then you hear David processing it. <laughs> After every phone call or after every meeting, I'm sure there's just like a lot of, oh, my God, I just met my sister for the first time. Blah. And so you're just coming along for this ride. Well, I guess you could choose not to. You could say, no, I don't want to hear about it. But then there'd be no ride at all. Right. There'd be no ride. You know, it just sounds like a whirlwind of activity and new people, like all of a sudden this new family to deal with. And, you know, family can be really hard in the best of cases. And it sounds like, you know, you've got four adoptees. So there's a lot of trauma and loss and grief happening already. And then you've got the dysfunction happening with the birth mother and the other siblings that don't even know who you are. And whew, it's just a lot. What were the, some things that you did that helped navigate, either of you, helped you navigate this whole process? What resources or what, I don't know, what tips do you have maybe for people that are going through this kind of situation? Well, I really don't have any suggestions because I think that what happened was it came at us quickly. Yeah. And so it was almost as if you're reacting to each thing and then finally sort of realizing that you're up to here with it and yeah. you want to do something different. But given the circumstances, it was difficult to say at a certain point, well, we can't see you this weekend or something yeah. or, or whatever it was. I, I'm just making that up. Uh -huh. It wasn't exactly like that. But, you know, once you got on this roller coaster, 
it wasn't really stopping for you. You were just going to keep riding it and being with them. And it's a wonderful story. And it was an exciting thing to be part of. But it did wear me out. I bet. But I am delighted about the whole thing. And it was interesting because when you've not been with these people for however many years, all of a sudden it's most important to be with them as much as you possibly can. And yeah. then who's the person who says, oh, yeah, this is just too much. Yeah. And I think that everybody wanted to be as enthused as everybody else ah. and willing to do things. But yeah, I think the other thing was that once the trauma of my birth mother's anger was over with and the rest of the story came out, it was a it was a feel good story. Right. I mean, everybody wanted to hear the story. Wow. Mm-hmm. You're, you're one of seven and it's you're meeting your siblings and mm-hmm. all of that. But in the early phase, just after we'd made contact with my birth mother and she was vicious, I mean, just vicious. I was off on a business trip and Tibby would come home from work and found just a, a horrible message on her voicemail oh. from this woman. Man. And my wife takes things very personally that happened to me. And so she had to bear the brunt of that. And because mm. she hadn't really heard it before, but I mean, because it was vile. I mean, the, the, she was really awful. So that part of it where we had to sort of, you know, lick our wounds a bit and yeah. sort of internally try to figure out the bad part of the story. Yeah. What was going to happen? What had I done? What, had I unleashed this obviously crazy person yeah. in our relatively stable life? Yeah. And it was a challenge for both of us to think about. Yeah. That. Fortunately, it was not too long before the story took a different turn. But, yeah. you know, I think that adoptees who are going to go try to find their family have to recognize that. And that's one of the reasons I've been a little hesitant over the years to sort of be an exemplar to adoptees because this is a happy story. I mean, it's been a good long-term story for me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stories don't turn out that way, right? Oh, yeah. You just never know. It could be absolutely wonderful or it could be absolutely horrible. And and it can kind of go back and forth like yours kind of did. It started off horrible and then it got really pretty good. And some bumps in the road like any family, right? But it's kind of a gamble. You don't know. Humans are complicated. (laughs) Right. Oh, and and so as long as adoptees are willing to take the risk yeah. and uh, recognize that they, you know, who knows what the, the yeah. facts are until you find them for yourself. Yeah. I think once you get into the process, you just have to roll with it, right? You, yeah. have to be, yeah. you have to be optimistic and hopeful and just play it out. Yeah. To you, what have been the most important values you've clung to, you and Tibby, as you've tried to navigate all this, what kind of core values have held you together as a couple and as you're trying to work through these relationships? Well, first, I guess what I would say is this happened when I was 40 years old. We had been married for, what did that mean? Maybe almost 15 years? About 15. Okay. Yeah. So we've been together for a long time. You were solid. We knew each other pretty well. Okay. We were solid. I mean, Mm -hmm. we we had uh, whatever our beliefs are, we had them, mm-hmm. right? Whatever our standards, whatever our values were, they were there. And we didn't really waver from those. I mean, we were fortunate. Nice. I think back to what if this had happened to me when I was 19? Oh. You know, what, or what if it happened, you know, a year after we were married? Sure. You know, we're still trying to figure ourselves out. I don't know that I had the equipment, the emotional equipment, the oh, intellectual yeah. equipment. I don't know that I had it to really absorb all of this. So in many ways, it happened to me at almost a perfect time. Yeah, it could have destroyed a relationship if it wasn't solid or if you weren't mature enough to handle all these crazy people calling you and and surprises. Yeah, well, that's a a very interesting way to look at it. So it's nice that you had that support. And if a person is maybe 19 or single or early in their marriage, it would be important to create a lot of support scaffolding around a reunion like this because I bet the feelings are just all over the place all over the map when something like that happens. And also the other thing is I, I had very supportive adoptive parents and there may have been one or two other adoptive parents in this group because there were a bunch of us, right? Okay. Oh, right, there, right. There were four, there were four of us given up and there were three families wow. among them. And so there were okay. lots of other parents. Ultimately, my parents were the last alive. And my mother, who's 99 years old, my adoptive mother is still very much alive. Aww. And 
she and my father were very supportive. I mean, they had no objections to any of this. And so, so great. you know, I would hope that that would be the opportunity yeah. that that, uh, that other adoptees who are searching for the families will have because it's a resource that you wouldn't want to lose, right? Oh, yeah. And I suspect that if I thought my parents would have objected to this, which they never did, maybe I never would have gone forward with it. A lot of people wait until their adoptive parents are gone. Which is sad because then a lot of times your other family might be gone too. You never know if you wait too long. On that point, I would hope that adoptees would at least have the courage to ask the question of their birth family to, to know what the real answer is rather than guess what the answer is. That's for sure. Didn't you say that your adoptive mom kind of informally adopted the other siblings as well? Yeah. Aww. As a matter of fact, several of them call her Mama Jane. Oh, um, that's so and so she loves getting uh, my wife and I don't have children. So thankfully, my siblings children have become her grandchildren as well. So that's oh, uh, oh, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. I that's mic drop right there. I can't I can't top that. I do. <laughs> I do have one question for you, though, before we start to wrap up. Why did you name your book Blind in One Eye? Well, first, on the most literal side, my birth mother, I learned, was blind in one eye. But that was also a pretty good metaphor for her, and I think to some extent me, in, in our failure to see the opportunities, the possibilities all the time. You're so caught up in the life you're leading and the goals that you have that you may not see mm-hmm. the, the opportunity to just off to the left or just to the right. Mm. So I considered myself, less so today, but during the time that I was going through all of this or, or looking that I was figuratively blind in one eye because I wasn't seeing that there might be other possibilities, that it might not be that I just had this older brother or that my birth parents were married or all of those things that I thought were true. And I also think that my birth mother, who was so caught up in her family legacy, having been a child of an old, important family in Virginia, she was so intent on preserving that legacy that she wasn't willing to chase the legacy she actually had, namely all these kids who yeah. have done interesting things and are yeah. a good family. And Definitely. So mm. long answer to a short question. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Tibby, do you have any last words that you would like to say? Maybe anything you'd like to say to other spouses or other family members, perhaps? Well, I think that I recommend that they jump into it feet first with their spouses. It may sometimes be a difficult journey but it's a very important one for their spouses. And Mm -hmm. ultimately you don't know what the adventure is going to be and what the results are going to be. Mm -hmm. I definitely would urge them to follow along. Yes. Oh, that sounds great. Any last words, David, anything I forgot to ask you about or anything else you'd like to mention? Oh, you forgot to ask me dozens of things, but it's (laughs) (laughs) Well, make sure to tell people how to get a hold of you. That would be good. Okay, well, my book is Blind in One Eye, and the website you wouldn't be surprised to know is www.blindinoneeye.com. Available on Amazon and all the typical places. So very good. Thank you for the plug. Yes, absolutely. I really enjoyed it. I read it on Kindle, so that makes it nice too. Well, thank you very much for sharing your story. This was very heartwarming and complicated and interesting to view family from your perspective, going from being an only child to I have a brother, I have six siblings. It's like, wow, it's such an interesting, unusual story. So thank you for sharing. And listeners, I hope that you will share this episode and come find us on unravelingadoption.com. We have lots to offer there for adoptive parents. We have events. I have a Healing the Adoption Constellation database, all sorts of things. I want to be of service to the adoption community. So find us at unravelingadoption.com. And just a reminder, I am a certified coach through the Virginia Satir Global Network. And if any of you are looking for guidance, validation, help raising awareness, or any problem solving regarding being an adoptive parent, I am particularly committed to helping adoptive parents and anyone who wants to transform their life and become more authentically you. You can find information about my coaching at unravelingadoption.com slash coaching. All right. Thank you all for listening. Tibby, David, and I want you all to stay Stay safe. safe.